Well, we're starting 2021 off with the bang. We're fortunate enough to have Tracker John in the house today. Um, Justin, you and I have been talking about this quite a bit. John, you've been gracious enough to take time out of your extremely busy schedule. I know I've been working you over. I, th I think I've been bothering you just about every single week. Uh, <laughs> that that so, may be a slight exaggeration. I, I don't know. We've had a, I can show you my text <laughs> messages, Justin. We've had a lot of going back and forth. But, you know, I, 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 I have to say, John, after the experience of being able to use you and needing your service and just being a part of it and Justin, you being there. And then of course, when that show aired, the amount of feedback that we got and talking to other people, man, it just brought up a lot of questions. I felt like this was just so necessary to do like this two part version of learn more about Tracker John and what's involved if you find yourself in a situation where you need a tracking dog. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're, gonna, we're gonna break it, it kind of into, into two parts, right? I think we're gonna cover a lot of the basics of tracking wounded deer with dogs, right? We're going to kind of cover a lot of the questions, common questions that we get asked from our friends or we see comments on videos, on your video, stuff like that. We're going to let John share some of his experiences with us, which he's got a number of them. Um, so John, let's get started with the very, very basics, right? Let's wind the clock back. How did you get started tracking wounded deer with dogs? Uh, a lot of people don't realize, but back in the day, I was a pretty hardcore bow hunter myself. Uh, used to build my own bows, uh, took moose, caribou, bears, deer, all with homemade equipment. So actually, I got into the dog thing for my own purposes. And it was a little bit uh, almost, well, it was unintentional. I used to do a lot of uh, bear hunting in Ontario and Canada, and I had friends that had bear hunting dogs. So we weren't using the dogs for hunting, but if we wounded one, sometimes we would borrow the dogs to see whether we could find the wounded bear. And what I quickly discovered was that sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't because those dogs were specific to the species, not to the individual animal. So if it wasn't, uh, you know, a really uh, super shot on the bear and it was uh, a, f a fainter scent coming off the bear, and if those dogs hit a fresher, more exciting trail, they were not opposed to switching off, and that's, that's where it would go south. Uh, but we did have enough success that, I, that the light bulb went off uh, that with a little fine tuning, if you trained a dog specifically for the blood, then you'd really have something. So did and you so have any experience with dog training or anything prior to this? Well, my family was always big into German Shepherds. We always had German oh. Shepherds when we were uh, growing up. And in fact, that's what I started blood tracking with okay. was German Shepherd. Uh, which, I mean, the German Shepherds are pretty versatile dogs. They, they may not be the best at any one thing, but they could do a whole bunch of things really well. And so that's, that's what I started with, even though uh, my bear hunting friends had, you know, the typical plot hounds and stuff like that. Uh, and another friend, bear hunting friend, he had a lab that wasn't trained for it, but just couldn't help but track bears, even though he was deathly afraid of bears. And that, that was actually my very first experience. We, we were uh, trailing a bear for a friend and we were stopped. We, there was no blood and the, the dog was gone. And this was at night and back in the day when flashlights weren't much, you know, these barely light up anything. And all of a light. sudden things, <laughs> Who or, didn't or, worse, <laughs> or worse, some plastic thing. Right. And all of a sudden through the bushes, coming and I was like wow and, and the, the dog comes running out and so uh, there's a French uh, French Canadian friend uh, the outfitter says to me well your friends your friends uh, bear is just up there and you know, well, how do you know well my 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 dog hates bears <laughs> and so he didn't do anything exceptional at all he just followed a red hot super easy trail to the bear afraid of the bear and ran back to us. Right. But those experiences were enough to show me that, yeah, if you really okay. fine tune this, this would be okay. something. Sure. So right. started off with German Shepherds, eventually switched over to Bloodhounds, which is what you have today, correct? Well, yeah, you know, so again, it was for my own purposes and then 
once I started uh, uh, getting more proficient at it, then friends would want me to do it. And then soon it was friends of friends and friends of friends of friends. And so it trickled out. It's not like uh, way back then I said, well, you know, I think I'll be a professional blood tracker. Well, there was no such thing. And so that wasn't even a thought. Uh, but as it grew and as I started doing tracks for more people and you're taking on trails that are less ideal, uh, then I started worrying about or wondering about a dog that would have an even better nose for mm. cold trailing. Uh, I, I mean, a light switch had to go off at some point. I mean, so, at some point you must have said, hey, you know what, the German Shepherds are going to be set aside. I'm going to make this transition. Well, it, it, mostly it came down to the nose. I, th I felt that uh, if I had a better nose on the dog, then I could do better work. Uh, when you're doing your own trails, or like uh, for 20, almost 20 years, I, I guided caribou hunts, did caribou hunts in the subarctic. And that's all I used up there was the German Shepherd. But that was similar to doing my own trails or trails for close friends when you're putting the dog on in the most ideal situation. It's basically fresh trails, they haven't been beat up, uh, so the dog has every advantage. But then when you start taking calls from the outside where people have already looked or maybe time's gone by, uh, plus just in the volume of it, you're gonna be taking on more trails that are tricky. So as, as that developed, then I, then the, the need I, I, I felt for uh, an even better dog uh, sure. develop. Now, if, if it's within the ability of the, the uh, German Shepherd's nose, then I have no qualms about using the German Shepherd just as good as the Bloodhound. But that's the if, if it's within the realm of the, the dog's sure. nose. Yeah. Sure. So how long have you been, I mean, is this what you do full time now? I mean, is this is this it? I mean, you Pretty are a full time much. Tracker, yeah. tracker. So how long, how many years have you been full-time doing this now? Well, so probably 15, 20. Okay. And I mean, in, like in full-time sure. during the season. So, I, haven't, I, mean, I haven't bow hunted probably since the late 90s. Oh, man, you're missing out. <laughs> uh, well, not really. He's well, getting the same adrenaline rush on all these different tracks. Perhaps on, more Justin. because yeah. it, the excitement at the end, I get it, you know, most every sure, time. Sure, sure. Uh, but then the other side is I bow hunted my brains out when I was young, so it's not like I've gone without. Sure. I, I kind of had my fill, and frankly, I feel that the work I do with the dogs now is uh, almost more challenging and rewarding than if I were just bow hunting for myself. Sure, hmm. sure. But the bottom line is I can't do both at the level I demand of myself. Yeah. So you had to make a choice. Right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was your and I first experience dealing with, you know, just a tracking dog in general right. to have John be out there and like, I mean, to watch you and the dog work was literally like one of the highlights of my season, for sure. I agree. Like it was the coolest thing or one and, of the coolest and, things and, I've and ever seen. my experience at my desperate need hey, of trying to find my dear. It was you, his best. What, <laughs> I, it was just so interesting to it watch, was. you know, my, my preconceptions of what how it was going to be, what it was going to be like. Like it was nothing like what it ended up being. It was far more in, kind of in-depth, and I was amazed at the intellect that the dog's have and how, how good they are like it was it was truly amazing to me so i mean it's safe to say i mean you've been on thousands maybe tens of thousands of of tracks you've seen pretty much everything there is to see when pretty it comes much to uh, on animals. rare occasions something happens as like <laughs> ooh, even that's a little bit no nope. right right but you've you've seen just about all of it pretty so, close um you know we had this, todd reached out to, to some of our guys and we yeah. had a few kind of questions come in you know some high level Questions that, again, I think a lot of people ask because they don't, they just don't know. You know, this is still, even though you've been doing it 15, 20 years, there's a lot of people that still No, don't, I've been doing it close to 40, you right, asked. 15 or 20 full time. full time. But there's still people that are, like, up until this year, I mean, Todd and I have been bow hunting a long time. We've never experienced this, right? Yes. So there's a lot of questions In that people have. In the mainstream, it is a relatively sure, new thing. Like, about right. how this kind of process works. So Todd, why don't you kind of start there? Yeah, we've got some, some good questions. questions. So let, let, let's go ahead and pick some. These are in no real order, you know, Tracker John. So let, let, let's just kind of pick one and go here. Um, 
Let's start off with this one here because I think this is a good one here. I mean, I think we kind of covered, let's talk about the breed of dog that you're using now. You covered the German Shepherd, but what breed of, I mean, if you're going to continue to do this, which you are, what breed of dog? It's an actual bloodhound. You're using? Bloodhounds. Okay. Straight up bloodhounds. And, and you have found over the years that that's, at this point, the dog that you believe can get the job done the best. For my purposes, the way we're doing what we're doing, uh, now a lot of people would answer that differently. And there's different uh, rules and techniques that are used in different parts of the country. So that might skew it totally different. But for the type of trailing that I'm doing, which is often cold trailing, the dog's on a line, um, I don't think there's anything better than the bloodhound. Okay. All right. That's my opinion. So, you know, starting... I, I saw nothing but good things with the bloodhounds. So. <laughs> starting at the shot, right? But, that's, but what you need to consider is getting yourself a bloodhound or a bloodhound puppy, that's square one. What pe people, a lot of times they see what I can do with the bloodhound and they say, oh, I'm going to get myself a bloodhound. Well, fine but just realize the amount of work and experience I've got and sure. have put in to have my bloodhound working like that. Sure, be, yeah. be that good. Yeah, no go doubt. Ahead. you no have a question you want to take Well, care? yeah, I mean, just let, let's say you're a bow hunter, right? You go out, <clears throat> you shoot an animal. One of the biggest questions we, we get from people is like, when do I know when I should call a tracker and when I shouldn't call a That's tracker? That's a great question. And I think that kind of goes along with Maybe the second question, which is kind of what is the biggest mistake people make before calling a tracker? So like in your experience, guy goes out, guy makes a shot on a deer. At what point in time do you believe that he should call you, know, you or another tracker to, to help? Um, and that's a little tricky. It, it kind of really depends on what the goal is. If the goal is find this deer with uh, as near to 100% certainty as possible, this is a must have, well then the time to call is the moment you suspect you've got an issue. Uh, now some people want to push it beyond that, but then you're running the risk of diminishing the possibility of re recovering your, your deer. Sure. So if it's a must have and you're calling the dog in sooner rather than later, Quite honestly, sometimes you're going to be calling the dog in when you could have done it yourself. You know, you call in, oh, 50 yards later, there's, there's the deer or something like that. There's the risk of that. But conversely, if you don't do that, you might do something on the trail that hurts the chances of the dog being able to do it. And what if it the, the, the type of the hit or the situation is right borderline, whether the dog can do it or not under the ideal conditions, and then if you allow them to deteriorate or you do something that uh, deteriorates the situation, now you've made what was gonna be possibly very difficult to begin with, all the more difficult or possibly impossible. Sure. Mm -hmm. So would you say kind of one of the biggest mistakes that people make is waiting too long to call you? Meaning like they take up the track, they don't have very good blood, they lose the blood or whatever, then they call all their buddies in, then they do a grid search, right. then when that doesn't turn anything up, then they call the tracker? Right, and so that's added all kinds of complications to the trail that we now have to sort through and work through. And again, it depends on the hit. If there was, I mean, it's, if it was what I call dead deer walking, it's really actually a pretty good hit, but for whatever reason, it's not leaving a, a, a steady blood trail on the ground. Doesn't really matter. That still is drifting down for the dog. And the dog, it, it might just lock on and blast it out and all that other interference might not make a lick of difference gotcha. the dog's just gonna lock and go but it's in the the less uh uh or more difficult situations where all that kind of uh sure. grid searching and trampling over and uh, cross contamination can then add difficulty to the to the trail and uh i mean the dog's got to be specific to that animal and blood but you don't, you don't realize just how many things that dog has to sort through. 
Okay, we're tracking your deer. Well, that's where your deer lives. That's probably where he beds. You go back in there. His scent is probably every place. He's been here and there and maybe just just hours before he came back as wounded. So the dog's got to go through all that layered scent. Um, If people have been traipsing around and then you've got overlapping on top of that. So as I'm trying to read my dog, uh, it it makes it more difficult for me to, to tell if the dog's hitting on something and what it might be hitting on. Sure. So it's just sure. so more So my, my understanding and from the people I've talked to and the stuff that I've read is, you know, I think for the most part, if a bow hunter makes a bad shot, usually they know it. Not all the times, but most of the time we kind of know it. We get down, we find the arrow. Hopefully we find the arrow, right? Signs indicating maybe it's further back than we want. It's probably one of the most common things you deal with, right? Whether it's liver, or gut, something like that, you know, Hunter looks at that arrow, knows that it's not going to be the best. Maybe they do give it 50 or 100 yards just to see, just Mm -hmm. in case. If nothing happens at that point, like, is that probably, like you said, that's about the time when you know, like, hey, I've got an issue. I'm going to just stop here, bring the tracker in versus kind of all the other options. Well, ideally. Sure. Yeah, I I think that brings up other questions, though, right, Justin? Because, I mean, you, you know, you and I at least going into this, knew about trackers, knew that this was a real thing. I mean, I think part of what has to come out of this is just people's general understanding that that this can even be done, right? And sure. I, I mean, I almost feel like what I think people have to do is almost put in their arsenal of bow hunting plans like any of us could end up in the situation. So you almost need to do your homework beforehand. Like, I mean, obviously if we went through the experience, John, I was lucky enough to connect with you and, and we had a great, you know, we had a great turnout. I don't think that's the way that it works out for everybody at all and I I think what people have to keep in mind is if you think that this could happen to you and you could be in this position you almost need to start your homework before you even let that arrow fly right like I mean meeting people like you smart thing to to have have your everything lined up right have a plan in place I guess I mean hopefully it never comes to that but if you hunt long enough well I think one of the issues and you know we know people that have run into this where they get themselves into a situation you know, and it, where they need a tracker or think they need a tracker, but when's it going to happen, right? You End of October through November, and guess what? Guys like John, he, he's one guy. He can only be in one place at a time. We might not even let him leave. And if he's experience. already on a track somewhere and he can't get to you in enough time to, to help with your trail and you can't find someone else, like none of this works without an actual tracker to come to, to do the work for you. So if right. you're waiting until you need somebody to try to find someone – you're kind of behind the eight ball, especially during that busiest time of the year. I can imagine your late October and November, you probably aren't sleeping a whole lot given well, what you do. before I did yours, Todd, I, I, I forget what happened before the one that was immediately before yours, but uh, I was on that one. I don't know how early in or late in the night I drove to it, Right. started it, at, met him at daybreak, did that, uh, it, as it turned out, he didn't know he had made a gut shot, but that's what we t- t- determined it was. We jumped the deer, so I had to, uh, we had to back out. And it was then that you called me, so then I had to determine, well, do I have enough time to drive to your location? And that's when I started begging. <laughs> <laughs> and get it done, and then I'd, maybe it'll work out by the time I get back, then I get back on the one that we had to back out of and so that was a, yeah I, a long I mean stretch there's not a lot of primo trackers to go around I mean I, I think that's just something that could be said realistically right like anything in the world guys I mean, it doesn't matter what you do for a living right there's always somebody that's at the top of the pyramid and that's not saying that people within the pyramid right aren't good or, or aren't going to be able to get the job done I, I think all we're trying to say with keeping this thing moving along is if this is something that you're really, really interested in sure. and you and, and you think, you know, that this could happen to you and you want to have the best odds of being able to recover deer, which I think anyone that watched our show, anyone that's in, involved in bow hunting always wants to do everything that they can. I, I don't think there's many people, John, that's ever called you, especially the people that are calling you, man. They are passionate. They care. They feel awful. They want to do what's right and recover mm-hmm. that animal. So I think what you have to do so we can move on to some additional questions is if this is something that you think you're interested in you need to make the calls ahead of time 
you need to do the planning ahead of time. And whether it's John or it's another tracker, right? Like John's kind of centrally located in our area, so we're fortunate, right? But I mean, people that are watching this, you, know, you may be in another state or whatever, there's other people that you're gonna have to probably reach out ahead of time so you have a plan in place. Because, you know, once that arrow flies, now the now the clock is ticking. I mean, and and, and, and two weeks later is not the time to call the tracker. I mean, right. So, and as you alluded that, to, uh, I mean, if you're doing it in advance, you get a little more time to uh, really see what that person's credentials are and what kind of a reputation he's got, how long he's been doing it. And instead of being in a jam at the last minute, you just have to take anybody you who can get. Sure. You don't you don't want the heart surgeon's first. You don't want to be the heart surgeon's first heart surgery, right? <laughs> well, everybody's got to start someplace, True. but maybe not on your trophy buck of a lifetime. Sure. Fair, fair enough. Like so, 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 so do your homework. But talking about that, you know, Todd says the minute the arrow flies, that's kind of when the clock starts ticking, right? Mm -hmm. One of the other common questions is like, how long is too long to wait to call the tracker, right? I mean, if you marched around for two days and can't find this deer, is it at that point, is it too late to call you or... What, what is your typical rule of thumb, so to speak? Uh, there really is no rule of thumb because there are so many variables. It's, okay. it's a pretty loaded question. Uh, on, a, on a hit that's superficial or maybe not going to kill the deer, uh, a really marginal kind of hit, the next day could be too long. There's just not that much coming off the deer. Uh, conversely, uh, some hits that were truly lethal and there was a good amount of scent coming off the deer initially. Uh, I've done some of those many days later, okay. many. So speaking about like the, the location of the hit on the deer, I mean, what is a tracker friendly type of hit that would give off a lot of scent? Um, well, there too, you kind of got have to talk in generalities sure. because there are no really hard and fast rules but you know high hits tend to be bad news uh, not only and as far as the the dog's uh, ability to to follow them but the results you're going to have in the end it just a lot of times just doesn't turn out well gut shots usually are high percentage uh typically or frequently at least, uh, there's good scent for the dog to follow. Not always, and some there are some gut shots, uh, low and way back uh, especially, that um, unfortunately, even some of those, I can't do much with the dog because they just can take days and days or even weeks. But that's, that's unusual. Typically, sure. a, a fairly solid gut shot, pretty high odds, and um, when I, get a call about that and usually, okay, game on. Okay. And I would say, you know, just to add to this too, I mean, I, I think any tracker that you call, because I, I know I I felt like I was on like the witness stand or something like that when I called you. I mean, because you are, you're a trained professional and, and you have your certain questions you're going to ask. I'm going to ask and, a lot and, of questions. And, right. And I mean, I would say it was almost like an interview process. I felt like I was being interviewed by John. It is. <laughs> Because that's what a good tracker should do. Like at some point, you've got to make a decision before you invest this time and go make this call that there's check boxes that are being checked off. So then you know that, you know, number one, you're dealing with somebody who you know knows what they've got. In our case, you know, in, in Justin's case, we're really lucky because we're filming all our stuff. So having that little bit of video footage is huge, right? Because, you know, at least we can see a little bit. But for most people that aren't able to see that, I mean, they are really going off what they see on the ground, what they see on their arrow, and maybe how far they initially started looking until they, they pulled out. So, yeah. you, you know, so be prepared when you make these kind of phone calls that, you know, a good tracker probably should be interviewing the daylights out of you. Yeah, you know, because sure. uh, I want to be able to give as best I can an assessment back to the hunter as to what I think the odds are. Um, so, you know, especially if, if you're somebody that's charging for your service, I, I want to kind of give the guy a heads up as to, you know, yeah, this sounds good. I think we got a good chance or, man, this doesn't sound good. It's possible, but I, I, I wouldn't bet heavily on it. And, you know, I, that goes back to what the deer means to the guy. I've got people that have called and said, you know, we're 99.9% .9 sure this deer is not dead, but it's such a big trophy. I want you to come and prove it. 
we want to know for 100%, if possible, that the deer is not dead. Interesting. Sure. That, that makes sense. Um, you know, one of the other questions we, we get asked a lot is about rain, right? Rain washing away rain, the scent, yeah. washing away the blood trail. Is it possible to bring in a dog after it rains and still find an animal? Yeah, absolutely. Again, it goes back to what was the hit truly to begin with. Uh, if it was superficial, hardly leaving anything for the dog right from the get-go, well, then an inch or two of rain on top of that might make it uh, uh, next to impossible, and maybe it was next to impossible to begin with. Uh, but if it was one of those dead deer walking and there was a lot of scent coming off the deer, uh, I, I don't hesitate uh, after even an inch or two of rain. I, okay. uh, now, I don't like it because there's no confirmation, no visual confirmation. I do a lot of trails, uh, as I was just saying, you know, where people really aren't sure if the deer is dead, don't think it's dead, and a lot of times it's not dead. So it's really nice to have that speck of blood that you can show somebody half a mile later or whatever, yeah, my dog's right, see, look at that, and make a uh, better assessment as to when to pull the plug on the trail uh, and to be able to prove what you've done. Rain eliminates that. Yeah. So you're, it's really 100% uh, trust in the dog. And, and you know, I, I can read my dog and think what's going on, but without anything visual, you're always wondering, well, did we miss something someplace? Sure, right. Or, right. Well, I remember that on, on your trail, right? I mean, so you're working the dog, right? And then we're kind of the guys that are looking for that visual confirmation Correct. of blood in the back. Because exactly. as you pointed out earlier, you know, we're in this deer's kind of core area. That's where he came from before he got shot. It's probably where he lives. He, there's beds, there's trails all over the place. The dog is trailing that deer, but we don't necessarily know if he's trailing that deer uh, on its wounded trail or on its right. still non-wounded trail, right? So you and I are looking for that speck of blood just to kind of reinforce that we're on the right trail. Well, and it, it actually goes way beyond that. It also, uh, we might be able to determine something about what the hit is from what kind of blood sure. we're seeing. Um, you know, it, it might give us some clues as to what we're truly dealing with. Yeah, okay. and there's no doubt. I mean, I think, and I know we're getting a little advanced here, but I mean, and I know we're talking about my track here just for a second, but I mean, that's where you and I, I think saw, and I think that's where the light bulb went off even in our head, in our heads with my deer, is we had that blood trail, we had that blood trail, and then we veered off, and we ended up down in the, the basically the buck's core bedroom where it was bedding. And then I mean, and that trail camera actually proved that it was like, hey, that buck was there. He was, he was there, there the day before. He, he was shot there him. the day before I shot him. Yeah, so we, we had walked past a trail camera at one point, which I grabbed the card out of, humped it back yep. to the truck to get my card reader, and sure enough, there was the day the buck the day before you shot him in there. He must have been betting close. It was like middle of the day 100%. type photos. So we knew he was in that area. The dog was on that scent. But obviously you've been doing this long enough to recognize like something like the dog just isn't totally locked on. He's having a hard time. We're not finding any blood. Let's go back. Let's reset at last blood. And sure enough, the buck took us or the, the dog took us in a different direction, right. which ended up being the right direction on kind of that second go around, which yeah. I thought was amazing. Yeah, well, and, I, and I think not to interrupt you, John, but I, mean, I think where that light bulb went off for you is when we, we did that circle, we got down there and we did it again. And each time we did it, we kept getting closer to where I ended up shooting the deer. And then it was kind of like, okay, no, this is just where that deer was living, where he was spending his time. And then he got up that evening and headed out to where I was where my stand was, you know, and that's when we realized you wanted to reset the dog. And then that's when the whole picture changed after that. But we still truly don't know what all happened. Your deer, even in a wounded state, could have made some circles up there. We know for a fact he was bedded there. So another thing that can happen is if the, the, the wounded deer is in a, in a spot for a significant period of time, that's as the wind blows this way, that way, that scent becomes a cloud. It's a saturated area. Now all of a sudden, and, and those molecules of scent can travel a long ways. So you can actually have scent from your wounded deer over an older track from before. So now the dog has to follow that for a little while to say, well, 
It's like sitting next to Justin who doesn't take a shower. It's just kind of like <laughs> just, it's in the area. You basically have to work <laughs> out of that cloud. Okay. Interesting. Well, whew, a lot of questions, so let, let, let's keep on moving on. Um, did there's I, a lot to analyze. As the, you yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot to kind of go through. You know, one of the questions we get, you know, a lot, and I know this is going to depend on the tracker and how far you got to travel and everything, but it's just general cost, right? I mean, what does it cost to have yeah. somebody come out in general? Do you charge a flat fee? Is it by the hour, by the mile? What do you typically tell people? And what do you I, see just industry-wise, right? Like, yeah, I don't necessarily... Yeah. Ever, you know, you well, know, just, there, I mean, there's new people that are starting out, and it's all fun and games for them, and they, they might do it for nothing or, just you know, a couple of bucks or yeah. something. Uh, there's people that are more expensive than me. Uh, typically, what I do is I charge uh, really by the trail, and it, it doesn't really matter whether I take... 10 minutes to find your deer or whether I'm working at it all day. It's the same. And obviously the travel can take the price up exponentially. Yeah. Sure. And I, I might sure. have more uh, in a round tip trip uh, travel to some trail than I, I did if I did two or three closer by me. Yeah. So naturally that's got to so affect So it's going to vary. It's going it, to kind of be all, yeah, it's all, all over, over the board. board, really. Sure. But again, it goes back to uh, what what are somebody's abilities or credentials that probably has a, f sure. a, a factor? Sure, well, it's like anything in life, right? You get what you pay for. I mean, we tell we tell that to, to everyone. Yeah, but I mean, I think we want to give people some idea of a number. I, I mean, I can tell you from my experience, and this isn't you know you specifically, but I mean, I've seen numbers from people that I've talked to, and I think even that you've talked to, anywhere mm -hmm. from like you said, John. I mean, some people are like, hey, listen, I'll just come and you know, do it to get some experience. And, you know, and at that point, if you know that someone's telling you that, then you have to plan on what you, you know, you have to expect that you might not get a lot, right? And then I've seen anywhere from 250 to 1,000 uh, up to $2,000. Like, I mean, that price is, sure, you know, in that, in that realm of what I've seen. I don't know what you've seen roughly, yeah. but that's been roughly what I've seen out there in the world. So, I mean, I guess you gotta give, we gotta give some people some idea what this costs for sure, so. Hopefully it doesn't happen to me again. Justin just flipped the bill for me. Whatever happens again. <laughs> I don't know if that's really fair, but <laughs> life isn't you fair. You take Justin. credit cards because I got the company credit. Card. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, there you go. Company credit cards. You... I don't. But... <laughs> the crypto. Let me guess. You're you're into the crypto you stuff, pay right? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Gold and silver. <laughs> gold and silver. Okay. There you go. A lot of talk about gold and Tom's silver. Got a lot of that. <laughs> oh gosh. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Let's. Let's keep moving on here. Um, let's see here. I, I think we covered. I think this is a good one here. Which one? Are you, which one are you looking at? What percentage of deer do you recover based on the number of tracks? That That's a great on? question. It's a great question. Let's just talk about last year. I mean, what was your legitimate stats for last year? Uh, I don't know. In the old days, I used to keep careful records. Now I don't keep records of anything. I just do as much as I can and don't want to be bothered with it. And at this point, I'm not really learning anything by keeping those records okay, anymore. Sure. So kind of the only reason I would keep them is kind of be able to brag about it. And I don't want to get in that trap. And one of the reasons I don't is because I want to uh, be willing to accept those calls that are going to trash those kind of statistics, like the one I was talking about, where they said 99% chance this deer is not dead. It's, it's, it didn't seem to be a good hit. I don't think it's dead, uh, but it's a tremendous trophy. So we want to give it everything. So come on and let's let's trail Still. it. So you, you take out a bunch of those, and your, your percentage is not going to look sure. very good. Uh, so. That's why I say it's a loaded question. If you were doing 50%, you're probably doing a stroke of good work. Okay. I think a lot of people are like a, a 30, 30%, something like that. And, and that's often with doing a fair amount of screening. And I, again, uh, you know, if I've got too many calls, I, I, I might screen in the sense that I'm going to analyze where I think I might do best. But uh, generally, if the guy's wanting to do it, and especially if it's some giant trophy, I'm, I'm game. But sure. that 
does spoil your okay. stats if that's yeah that makes what you're sense. So, so let's say let's just use the number of fifty percent on average, right? You're doing you know, good work. You're, you're recovering fifty percent of the deer you you go after. Of the remaining fifty percent that aren't recovered, in your opinion, how many of those deer do you think are eventually dead somewhere and are actually still alive? Um, I would say we miss almost nothing that's actually dead while we're trailing it. Okay. Um, do some of them end up dead uh, later on, sure. Sure. weeks sure. later or something like that? Yeah, there's a few of those. Uh, and then actually I've recovered some of those by going back in and doing an area search uh, later on for the carcass. Uh, but the vast majority are not dead and they're on their feet and they're staying on their feet. And it's very rewarding when I've made my analysis and then I get proof later on, I get a trail okay, camera right, picture sure. or the same guy, oh, here he is, I got him on the second try. Uh -huh. uh, that kind of thing to, yep. to prove that we were right. And that happened a whole bunch of times this year. Right. And on some big right. ones. Which makes sense. I mean, you, you know, you, 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 you shoot one, you don't kill it. One of those high spots you're talking about. And what do you know? You go out hunting two, three weeks later and there's the deer. Shoot the same deer. Yeah, shoot the sure. same deer. Fair enough. So, I mean, for the most part, I mean, there's a, there's a pretty good amount of tracks you go on where you feel like that deer is still alive at the end. Yeah, the and end then you've got to make that judgment call. Of course, and somewhere, yeah. I like to try to have multiple pieces of evidence leading me to that conclusion that I don't think this is a deer we're going to get or there's nothing more we can do on this one. I, you know, a piece of evidence um, can be very misleading whether it's blood on the ground or lack of blood on the ground and what the arrow looks like. Uh, but I start stacking pieces of evidence as we're going through the trail, including uh, how I'm reading my dog. That's, I can tell a lot with how my dog is working the trail, whether I think the deer is dead or not, depending on what other things I know about the trail, how old the trail is, those sure. kind of things. So it's actually kind of a complex uh, yeah. That's number interesting. of things. Well, I mean, you gotta think the dog has its own experience. So, I mean, it's learned from all of its various experiences. So probably the more anxious that dog is on that trail, the better off well, the chances of recovery what are. ease or difficulty the dog is working the trail, um, but you know, again, there's there's always exceptions, so you gotta sure. weigh it all. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, you, you know, I've been around enough dogs just because of the pheasant hunting club, and I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, all dogs aren't created equal, right? All trackers Correct. aren't created equal, and I mean, I think one of the things that I noticed too, John, you know, the difference of my personality and your personality. I remember just when we first, when Justin and I first met you, you know, you're just very. You, you know, like like the guy that shot the deer is amped up. You know, it's like, you know, you're sitting there like, oh my gosh, so when is this guy gonna get here? Is he stopping at Chipotle or what the heck is this guy doing? Yeah, you know, and then, and then it rained that one day when Casey, you were coming. Casey's Todd, it's a hunting video. Okay, fine, Casey's, he's stopping getting at Casey's pizza, for a slice sorry. Of pizza. There's plenty of Chipotle's out there, but. Um, Not in rural America where we're deer hunting. <laughs> that's around. true, but. Um, you, you know, I, I know just, I, I was so anxious and, you know, just, I, I think, you know, John, you know, to toot your horn real quick, it's just, you know, your calmness. So when you got there, like you had your plan, you just laid it all out. And I think you witnessed that too. Sure. Just it very methodical, just, right? right. I mean, well, I got all my gear was it take me 10, 15 minutes just to gear up. <laughs> Strapping on all his knives. <laughs> right. like, I've never seen so many knives. In battle. <laughs> I felt insignificant. I, I felt, I, I felt like I needed to go buy bigger knives after hanging around with John. Um, <laughs> But no, I, I, you I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, just, you know, again, I mean, just, I learned so much from this experience. We want you guys or anyone that's listening to this to, to learn as much as possible. And I think we've covered a lot of ground. I mean, I think one, if you're going to use a tracker, you do, you know, watch this video, learn as much as you can, get ahead of it, have a plan. I mean, I think we've talked about that. Success rates. We've talked about some good numbers in terms of, you know, where, you know, and what people can expect. It's not 100%. This is not a 100% period thing. I mean, I mean, deer can still be alive. There may be restrictions on how far someone who shot a deer can go. They, and there may be a neighboring property who's uh, not going to let them go on property that piece of issues, property. Yeah. Which, which could, again, blow up statistics. I mean, you could 100% have what you need, oh, and you hit a line, and it's over. There definitely have been uh, instances where I feel we would have got the 
the deer, but just could go no farther. You just can't permission. go any further. Yeah. Right. So I, I, I mean, that makes sense. Um, I think we covered a lot with the bloodhounds. I mean, that seems to be your, you know, your, your, your favorite breed. Obviously, there's other people using other breeds that are out there, but definitely, you know, what and I for witnessed, their reasons think that it's superior for their purposes. So. Sure. Um, I, I think the next thing I'd like to talk about too, and I think a good question that, that we haven't really covered is, do you need to have a blood trail? I mean, I think we've touched on it, but I don't think we've really gone over it. So, I mean, if let's say someone loses the blood trail and there is no more blood, they're saying there is no blood. Do you need a blood trail to find that dog? Uh, not dog, find that deer. <laughs> no. 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 Just because there's no visual blood trail doesn't mean that there isn't a scent of blood that's coming down off the deer. Okay. And, yeah. And we witnessed that. I mean, we saw yeah, that for no, sure. no question about it. Which was amazing. You mentioned during a track that we were on that the dog also has the ability to pick up just the actual scent of that deer. I forgot the signature of the deer. I think maybe you alluded to at some point. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, again, there's different uh, st tracking strategies. Uh, well, tracking and trailing. I actually do trailing. Cool. Uh, blood trailing. There are people that focus on the track scent. I do not. Uh, so, blood just emanate the the scent molecules of blood emanating down. But also, I'm sure that there are hormonal changes or whatever in a seriously wounded do uh, deer or animal that also is being left. For the okay. for the dog, so uh, if I say scent picture, that's mostly what I'm I'm talking about. Okay, I really don't want my dog following s totally superficially wounded deer or just the track scent. I mean, theoretically, I could train my bloodhound to follow a, a particular unwounded deer, but I don't work on that at all. I don't. I don't want my dog doing that. And one of the benefits of that is, especially like with my outfitters that I'm uh, responsible for, and especially during, say, muzzleloader season, uh, uh, shotgun too, but they'll, they'll say, we don't even know if this deer is hit. Go out and see whether it's even been hit or not. Hmm. Well, that's, that's a right. tricky scenario. I mean, how do you prove what doesn't exist? Um, but there again, it's because my dog's not going to follow anything that's not wounded. So if okay. I, I work it and the dog's just circling and circling and it's like, what do you want me to do? That's a good point. I, Cause I mean, in a, in a gunshot deer, you don't have an arrow to, to right. look at. And, and, and a lot of times, especially with the muzzleloader is not a, a good blood trail, yeah. if any blood trail. Yeah. And the smoke. So the guy has yeah. no clue what's happened. Uh, so I'll get some of those, and that goes back to, well, when you want to talk about success rates, well, if I'm getting sent out for trails that we don't even know if we got a trail. Sure, <laughs> sure. Right. That's going to drive success rates down a little, a little bit, a I would imagine. <laughs> but conversely, though, in those instances, you can be following a trail. There's not a speck of blood. Nope, there's the dead deer. Sure, sure. Yeah, I've been on a few of those before. Those are interesting ones. A few. A few. <laughs> well, I mean, the ones where there's like literally no blood. Right. And, all of a I, and, a dead deer. and then there's a dead deer. It you know, happens. Those, those have definitely happened before, and they're always very interesting to me okay. how that happens. Okay. Um, I am buzzing through these questions here to make sure we haven't missed any. Um, Justin, do you have any more over there that you want to take on? I, I'm good for right now. I think I want to get into some of the more interesting aspects and experiences that you've had through the years kind of in this this next video. But I think for purposes of this one, I mean, if there's I anything agree. else you want to say to, to people out there that, that, again, don't know a lot about right. dog tracking, why, how, you know, how to get a hold well, of somebody. I guess I'd just like to make a final comment about the, the uh, statistic question. Um, I would, now I've been doing this for decades, 
and literally I'm training year round, I'm putting everything into this. But I would still never say that I couldn't miss something somewhere. Sure. It, it, uh, it's possible. I mean, it almost never happens, but it's possible. Um, if the deer is dead, chances are we're going to find it. But I still would never say with 100% certainty weird right. things happen. Uh, there have been some backtracks, substantially long backtracks that we were able to figure out just by the, and got lucky and just by the skin of our teeth, we ended up finding that animal. So weird things can happen that uh, even the best of the best, I suppose, could could uh, miss if just the wrong scenario went down. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other thing I'll say, you know, and this is kind of more of a you specifically, because you're the only tracker I've been, you know, a part <laughs> of going on a track on, but, you know, as a, as a hunter, so often, you know, you, you shoot this animal, you're on the highest of highs, right? You shoot this animal, oh my gosh, it all came together, I got my shot, it all kind of comes crashing down when you realize you didn't make the best shot or you take up the trail and it's not the best trail, then that kind of fear and panic starts to set in, right? And you get a little bit too far ahead of yourself, you start skipping along, and you know, eventually there becomes this kind of despair, right? Of like, shoot, you know, now you're just down in the dumps, so you can't find it, doing whatever. But I mean, we were on your trail for quite a number of hours, you know, and I'm sure it's certainly not the longest track you've ever been on, but I know at one point in time, you and I are sitting there talking to each other going, man, like, this just this doesn't sucks. seem like it's going to happen, right? And you're starting to like, we're getting down. We're like, dang it, you know, we're not going to get this deer. But the whole time, John, you're like a machine. Like he just kept going and going. And he's like, we're going to find this deer. I saw the hit. I, I Like he just kept going and going. And that persistence, I think sometimes, you know, we... We, we were never failed. talking about John behind his back <laughs> at, at all, were we? <laughs> no, but I mean, it's just... Um, you know, that positive persistence of just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. I'm like, in the end, like, that's what successful that people ultimately end up doing. Yeah. You don't give up. And I think it's easy for guys to, to get on a track like that and, and not have blood or go the wrong direction. And at the fork in the trail, you're like, I think the deer went this way. And, you know, and then you got nothing and you're sitting yeah. there going, dude, I, I lost my deer, you know. But, I mean, you've, I, I think that just comes from a lot of your experience and knowing you know, and, and knowing that you're looking for that one little breakthrough that yeah. all of a sudden can open it up. Yeah. 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 But I mean, John, man, you didn't give up. And, I don't and give up easy. No, no. I, I figured that much. I mean, I left. I had to go home. I had to pick up my kids or something. You missed the you best know? of the I, best. I thought it was over with. I was like, this is like, this, this thing's vanished into thin air again. And 20 minutes later, you're calling oh. me on the phone. I thought you were calling me like you were back at the truck. Like, oh. dude, you know, I was getting the, like down in the dump phone <laughs> call. Sucks. And it's like, we got him. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. So, I mean. Well, it definitely works. I, I mean, if you can find the right tracker, who knows what they're doing, and you can have a plan in place. Don't give up. And don't give up. It definitely is something you want to know about, you want to learn about, because it can be the difference of being able to find your deer or not find your deer at all. So, you know, John, I mean, I think, um, you know, this has been great. It's a great, you know, Good. introduction for people to be able to have that, you know, step one in, in planning, uh, you know, what to be thinking about, when they should maybe make that phone call, what they should do and what they shouldn't do. I think you've learned a lot from this video as far as, you know, you know, those kind of decisions. Um, so that's great. Hopefully well, just let me add about uh, the not giving up thing. Obviously, if you're trailing deer that aren't dead, at some point you do have to give sure. up. Uh, but I don't give up easily. I want to uh, uh, exhaust all options. And as I said earlier, I want to stack multiple pieces of evidence to lead me to the conclusion, okay, finally now it's time to give up. Sure. Got it. Yeah, that, that, that definitely makes sense. Well, John, we appreciate you being here today. Oh, you're welcome. It's been Definitely. awesome. I'm looking forward to part two of the video where we get into some of my fun questions that I want to ask. John's yeah. just, uh, this wealth of experience. <laughs> right, I want to suck it. We want to get as awesome. much of it out of you as we so can. So we're going to talk about some fun stuff, so make sure you guys check back for part two of this video coming at you very shortly.